Hello everyone, welcome to the Cyber Rangers CVE training series. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the Dirty Pipe Linux Privilege Escalation Vulnerability. Uh, the CVE code for this particular vulnerability is CVE 2022-0847. So obviously, if you've clicked on this, uh, that means you're actually going through the Dirty Pipe uh, lab on Cyber Rangers. And what we're going to do before we actually take a look at anything practical is get an understanding or an overview of the vulnerability. And uh, secondly, how the exploit is performed or, or really what causes the vulnerability. Uh, and th that'll give you a better understanding of what's going on in the background. So uh, let's get started firstly by getting an introduction to the vulnerability. So what is Dirty Pipe? Well, Dirty Pipe, also known or identified as CVE 2022-0847, is the latest vulnerability affecting the Linux kernels uh, ranging from version 5.8 and newer. The vulnerability was discovered by Max Kellerman in April 2021. However, it was not made public as he was still trying to figure out what caused the vulnerability and how it could be exploited. I do recommend that you take a look at Max Kellerman's blog post on how he actually discovered it while uh, developing or uh, sort of assessing an issue with uh, ba daily backups or rather weekly backups on, uh, you know, for the company that he was working on and how he came to find this vulnerability. So this is essentially a local privilege escalation vulnerability in the Linux kernel that could potentially allow an unprivileged user to do the following. So they could either modify or overwrite arbitrary read-only files, like the Etsy password file, uh, to essentially change the password of a particular user. And of course, that'll make sense once we get into the practical side of things. Uh, you, an attacker could also potentially abuse or hijack SUID binaries by modifying them. And again, as I said, this will make sense when, once we get into the exploitation phase. So simply put, this vulnerability could potentially allow attackers to overwrite or modify data in arbitrary read-only files, which can consequently lead to local privilege escalation. So just to reiterate, this is not an initial access exploit. This is a privilege escalation vulnerability, which means uh, if an attacker gains access to a Linux system or a Linux server, uh, this is typically where this uh, vulnerability would come into play when they're moving from initial access onto privilege escalation. All right, so what versions of the Linux kernel are affected? Well, Linux kernel versions newer than 5.8 are affected. And so far, the vulnerability has been patched in the following Linux kernel version. So, you know, version 5.6.11, version 5.15.25, version 5.10.102. And of course, uh, distributions like Ubuntu, Debian, etc. have all released, uh, you know, patches for this vulnerability. And as of recording this video, uh, the vulnerability has been patched in most modern versions of the Linux kernel. If you want to learn more about the vulnerability, you can learn more by taking a look at the actual uh, MITRE post on this, as well as the write-up by Max Kellerman, uh, and this is all referenced in the slide here. As you can see, the severity uh, on the, the actual CVSS version 3 severity is set to 7.2, and of course that gives you an idea as to uh, you know, what impact this may cause or may have on your uh, a company's uh, assets or uh, digital infrastructure. So keep that in mind as well. So now that we have an understanding of when this uh, vulnerability was discovered, uh, let's get an understanding of what causes the vulnerability. Now the vulnerability, in order to understand the vulnerability, you need to have an, a good understanding of how the Linux kernel works, uh, how user space and uh, the kernel space uh, system within a kernel works. And in addition to that, you also need to know how pipes on Linux works, or rather on Unix systems work. So the vulnerability is caused by an uninitialized pipe buffer flag variable, which overrides any file contents in the page cache, even if the file is a read-only immutable or a read-only mount. The flags member of the new pipe buffer structure lacks proper initialization in the copy page to iteration pipe and the push pipe functions in the Linux kernel, which could contain stale values. An unprivileged local user could leverage this flaw to write to pages in the page cache backed by read-only files and consequently elevate their privileges on the system. This is because the page cache is always writable by the kernel and writing to a pipe buffer never checks for any permissions or privileges. And of course, I'll explain what all of this means in a second. So how does the exploit work? 
Well, the exploit works by following the following steps. And of course, we're going to be taking a look at a few proof of concepts uh, that uh, automate this process. Uh, the first step will involve creating a pipe and redirecting data into the pipe. This will ensure that the pipe buff uh, flag can merge flag has been set for the pipe buffer. You then need to drain the pipe, leaving the pipe buff flag can merge flag set in all pipe buffers. Uh, the vulnerability is caused when the pipe buff flag can merge flag is set uh, and not reset for all the other pipe buffers. You then need to splice data from a read-only file like the Etsy password file into a pipe that has that flag set. The pipe buffer with the pipe buff flag can merge flag contains uh, that contains a reference to the data that was piped earlier. Uh, we can therefore write data to that pipe buffer, consequently overwriting the content of the referenced file. Uh, this happens because write permissions are not applied to pipes. So let me explain a couple of things because this might be a little bit confusing, especially if you're not familiar with how Linux works at a very uh, fundamental or rudimentary level. Um, so before I actually do that, if you want to take a look at the references and uh, you know if you want to get a link to all the exploits that were used uh, within this scenario as well as this video, uh, you can find them linked to this slide. So let's get started. Uh, you know, and in order to get started, we need to get a better understanding of what's going on. And all of this is referenced in the scenario mission. So let's actually take a look at that. All right, so I'm currently on the Dirty Pipe scenario mission. So I've, got, I've already started the scenario here. And in this particular case, uh, in order to access the vulnerable uh, server, uh, you do not need uh, access to the VPN as a web SSH session will be provided to you. So this can be performed in browser without any issues. However, before we actually take a look at that, uh, you can see that under the mission, I've gone into greater depth uh, with regards to how uh, or what causes this vulnerability. So uh, again, if you take a look at the mission here, you can see that I've gone over at a very basic level, uh, Linux memory management, uh, pipes, as well as the uh, pipe, uh, or rather the splice system call, pipe buffer flags, how the exploit works, etc. So let's just uh, take a brief overview, or let's get a brief overview of all of these aspects, all of these components. All right, so Linux memory management. So in order to understand how this vulnerability can be exploited, you'll need to get an understanding of a few memory management concepts. So number one, what is a page? A page is the smallest unit of data, typically four kilobytes, that is managed by the CPU and is used for memory management by the Linux kernel. In the context of this vulnerability, we will be primarily focusing on how pages are used to read and write data from the disk. What is a page cache? The page cache, also known as the disk cache, is a memory cache that is used to manage pages. All right, now that we have an understanding of what pages and what page caches are, let's take a look at pipes. All right, so pipe denoted by the pipe symbol is used to redirect or transfer standard output from one command program process or file to another command program process or file for further processing. If, you're, if you've used Linux before, you should be familiar with what pipes are and what they're used for. So for example, we can utilize the pipe command in conjunction with the cat and grep commands to identify a specific string in a text, uh, in uh, a, a specific string of text in a file by running the following command. So we can cat out the contents of Etsy password and then pipe that to grep and uh, we specify the grep uh, arguments that we want to use. In this case, we are limiting, we're looking for any instances of the uh, of the word root. So as you can see, I've added a screenshot here that highlights that and that's how pipes work. All right, so this is just one example of how pipes work. And now that we have an understanding of how pipes work, let us take a closer look at a specific Linux system call called the splice uh, system call, uh, as it is used to optimize how pipes access data. So let's take a look at the splice system call. The splice system call is used to move data between a file descriptor and a pipe without going through user space. The splice system call is used to optimize the transfer of data between a file descriptor and a pipe. It does this by moving references to the page, storing the data contained within a file, consequently directing a pipe to a page loaded in memory that contains data from a read-only file that was previously accessed. In this context, a file descriptor is a unique identifier for an open file. Now that begs the question, what is a pipe buffer flag? All right, so in order to understand what a pipe buffer flag is, 
in the context of this vulnerability, an attacker could potentially utilize the splice system call to transfer a page into a pipe and override the data in the pipe buffer, consequently allowing for read-only files to be modified. The root cause of the vulnerability is the pipe buff flag and merge flag that was implemented in the Linux kernel in 2020. The flag is applied to pipe buffers and instructs the Linux kernel to write changes uh, to write the changes made to a file to the original file that is stored on disk. So make the changes that were made uh, to the file in memory and apply those changes onto the file on the disk, making them the changes permanent. So uh, a vulnerability in the Linux kernel, uh, you know, allows the various flags to be set for newly created pipe buffers. So that's essentially how the exploit works. Now, in order for this exploit to be performed, uh, you need, you'll need access to a file that is read-only for all users, including and especially for standard unprivileged accounts. And the Linux target must be running a version of the Linux kernel that is affected uh, by the vulnerability. And uh, again, as I said, the, the structure of this scenario is very simple. Uh, we're going to assume that you've already gained access to a, uh, a Linux server as an unprivileged user. So I'm just going to open up the web SSH session. And uh, let me just enable my pop-ups here. So preferences, and I'm going to allow pop-ups. So there we are. That's going to open up the web SSH session there. And uh, you'll see that you'll be provided with access as a user called unprivileged. And we currently have access to an Ubuntu system. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. And if you list out the, current, the contents of the current directory, you can see we have the checker and the exploits. So if we take a look at the uh, the actual checker here. So I'm just going to say dirty pipe checker. This is the vulnerability scanner. It's essentially a bash script that will tell you whether the version of the Linux kernel that you're on is vulnerable to the vulnerability. So we can say we can execute it by saying dpipe.sh and you can see the current version of the Linux kernel is version 5.15.0 and in, uh, it is indeed vulnerable. So we'll take a step back and let's head over into the exploits directory. So uh, we'll just navigate into dirty pipe exploits and this is the github repo that I'd referenced So there are three files that you need to be aware of. We have a compile script that will compile both the exploits as they are in C and uh, It'll compile them into binaries that you can use now You might be asking yourself why on earth do we have two exploits? Well, that's very simple uh, in the scenario mission You can see that I've highlighted that we have two exploitation uh, techniques uh, the first exploit, also known as exploit one, uh, essentially allows you to modify uh, the contents of the password file and replace, uh, as you can see right over here, if we take a look at it here, if we analyze exploit one.c, um, this exploit will, uh, conf uh, will essentially replace the root user account password with the password piped uh, and will take a backup of the Etsy password file under the following directory so that you can always restore the changes that you have made. So if you if you take a look at the exploit, uh, it'll, it'll essentially explain what's going on. So let's do that right now. So I'm going to say vim uh, exploit 1.c. So if we take a look at it here, you can see that it's fairly simple to understand. Um, and uh, there are comments uh, that have been added to the code to explain how this works. So if we take a look at the first, uh, or rather this section here, we can see that this, uh, this this particular function will create a pipe where all the buffers on the pipe inode info ring have the pipe buff flag and merge flag set. And then it'll fill the pipe completely and each pipe buffer will now have the pipe buff flag and merge flag set. It'll then drain the pipe and then they'll tell you, the, uh, or at this particular point in the code, the pipe is now empty. So uh, if somebody adds a new pipe buffer without initializing its flags, the pipe uh, buffer will be mergeable. All right. And at this point, uh, we are in the main function, uh, what's happening is we're essentially specifying the file, in this case, the password file. And uh, if we take a look at what else is going on here, you can see that new data is added to the password file, whereby we're essentially changing the value of the root user account's password. And this can be done in the password file, as you may already know that the passwords are typically stored in the shadow file, but this can also be done in the password file as the password file originally was used to specify the password of each user account, whether they were in a hashed, uh, in a hashed state or not. And I've also highlighted the command that can be used to generate a password. Uh, so in this case, I used OpenSSL, and you can see that the password value or the clear text password is just piped. 
All right, so that's what is happening here. So we can essentially compile all the exploits. I'm just, I'm just going to run the compile script here. There we are. And you can now see we have the two binaries. So if we run the first binary, which is just exploit one, uh, you'll see, we'll give it a couple of seconds. There we are. It's going to back up the original password file so that you can restore it. It's going to set the root password to piped. And then it's going to restore the uh, the original Etsy password uh, from the one that you backed up in the temp directory so that, uh, you know, all your mess is cleaned up. And in this case, you've, you've already obtained the access that you want, which is root access. So if I say ID, you can see that I'm currently the root user. And let me just spawn a bash session here. So uh, let me just uh, make sure that that is visible. So there we are. You can see that that stopped it. So I'm just going to run it again. If I type in ID, there we are. So we now have root access and you can now check the contents of the root directory to get the flag. All right. So that is the first exploit. The second exploit is uh, much simpler to understand. And this will involve hijacking SUID binaries. All right. Now, uh, when it comes down to hijacking SUID binaries and leveraging the dirty pipe exploit, uh, of course, you'll need to require or you require a target uh, SUID binary. In this particular case, we'll be utilizing the sudo binary. So you can see uh, you can search for SUID binaries by running the following command. And uh, in this particular case, we just need to run the exploit to binary and specify the SUID binary that we would like to target. So in this case, the way the exploit works is it uh, hijacks the SUID binary, it drops an SUID shell, and then restores the original SUID binary and then provides you with a root shell. So fairly simple to understand. I'm just going to say exploit2 and uh, user bin. In this case, we need to specify the correct path there. So user bin sudo. And we hit enter and there we are so we get a root shell and that is essentially how to exploit the dirty pipe vulnerability in order to elevate your privileges and with that being said what you can do now is take a look at the assessment section here that will assess your knowledge of the vulnerability and finally you'll also need to provide the actual flag uh, contained within the root directory to verify that you've been able to compl uh, successfully complete this particular scenario. So that is going to conclude this video. Uh, do take a look at the mission. I've gone over the actual um, vulnerability in much more depth than I have explored. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me.